All right. Hello, everyone. I am glad you are joining me today. We're going to have a good time. Pastor Kate is a wall on me. Remember I said we had to start an hour earlier? Uh, that's because we double booked ourselves. And so Kate is already on her way to set up for what we're doing next. And so she's gone ahead. And then as soon as this class is over, then I got a quick jump in the car and shoot there to do the next thing. So that's just kind of how life goes. All right, let's start with, in case you're curious, we're talking about the Bible today. Let's start with what did you hear yesterday that's really impacted you today? Did anything that we talked about even impact how you approach the Bible today? I'm curious from you all. What do you have to say? I'm going to let you talk so I can pretend I'm not going to monologue the whole time. We'll see if I actually do or not. Now I keep freaking out. I'm like, oh, music. And so then, so you don't have to listen to the music the whole time. Like yesterday, that was a failure. All right, Elise, I saw your hand go up. the New Testament scrolls. Yeah. I just think that's so crazy. Isn't that cool? It wasn't that long ago, and it l proved the whole Old Testament. So cool, isn't it? All right, Tammy. Same thing that Elise, you know, just all of the information about how soon they found it, um, the amount of words, the amount of verses, just the the amazement, uh, the, just the amazement of it all, really. Brought, it's just pointed out how valuable, like, you know, like what a miracle it is and how, how it's so important, like all of those things that we learned mm -hmm. yesterday that mm -hmm. you don't really think about, you know, how many verses, how many books, you know, just all of it is just amazing to me. And I, you know, I being being born and raised Jewish and only being um, shown the Old Testament right. my whole life. And then um, as I got older and started delving into things that I was questioning and believing on my own, I was, you know, I, I said to a lot of people like that, to me, it was like, leaving in the middle of the movie or reading the book <laughs> and then not finishing the end. Like, how are you not, how are you not recognizing the new Testament? How are you right. only looking at the old Testament? And to this day, I, I still feel the very same way. Like there's, how do you not acknowledge the rest of the book? I just don't, I can't comprehend that. But, um, yeah, it's, and when, especially when there's so many, uh, proofs, that Jesus was the Messiah. I, I, you were part of our Easter reboot, right? I, I think you were. I did. I missed and, the Easter reboot. I was in New York. Oh, that's right. And we go yeah. through how many, there's, there's over 300 parts in the Old Testament showing Jesus, exactly what he went through. And we went through a bunch of them. And it's crazy how someone could say that uh, Jesus wasn't the Messiah. When there's so many things that just scream and the word, this is Jesus. This Jesus is the Christ. He's the coming Messiah. It's so wild. No, it is. It's mind boggling to me because like I said, I was only exposed to the Old Testament. And, you know, when I found out about, I was like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? There's more? There's another book? There's a whole <laughs> other story? You know, and I couldn't, I was like, what? I just, it was mind boggling to me, that, that revelation. And, you know, yeah. to this day, I, I don't understand it. It's to me, it's just all one long story. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And I think understanding some of these things, like what we talked about yesterday and even what we're going to talk about today, reveal how amazing our word is and it changes the way we approach it. Because then it's not just a book like what we talked about yesterday. This is the words of God written for us to not just read so we can um, 
have a religious duty and knock it off. Like, yep, I'm up to five days in a row on my Bible reading. I'm feeling good about myself. It's not about that. It's about... Exactly. It's really literally the the most amazing how-to book ever written. How to do life. It's it's all in there. It's a how-to book. Yeah. Really. That's how I look at it. Anyway. Yeah. No, I like it. I like it. All right. Anybody else? Well, Michael's joining us twice now. He's really throwing me off. Michael wrote earlier, uh, his, he really enjoyed the history backing of the Bible. Supporting documents was monumental compared to commonly taught historical figures in school. And that's exactly right. No one questions Socrates or or Caesar's biography or any of these things. But when it comes to the word, well, you know, things have changed. And the the supporting documents are ridiculously in God's favor in this one. All right. Any other comments from yesterday before we go on? Nothing. Okay. So yesterday we talked about what is the Bible. We spent a good chunk about that because and I'm not overwhelming. I am too loud, aren't I? We, uh, in order to approach the Bible the way God wants us to, we have to realize what it is. Today, we're going to talk about who the Bible is. We're going to dig in deeper than we've been able to do in any Root Bible Academy class. So I am so excited about this. It is going to be so fun because when you realize who the Bible is and what that means to us, how we approach the Word it changes. It's it's awesome. So we're, let's start off. Some of you are like, okay, I think I know this. Oh, just wait. It's 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 fun. So we're going to start off with John chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to kind of tear this apart a little bit. And I hooked us up with a little bit of upgrade. Oh, yeah. Look at that. So for those of you on a phone, I'm sorry. You probably can't read that. Those of you watching the recording on social media or um, are watching the, well, recording social media, I guess that's it, or are on a computer right now, you can see this way easier than you could on the Easter reboot. For those of you on a phone, I'm sorry, it's still going to be a little tiny. But even though, wait, let me make sure, make sure you know this. Oh, I forgot to take that off again. Even though we're joining from, or let me say it this way, even though I'm putting it up on the screen, that doesn't mean I don't want you to read in your own Bible. You have to read in your own Bible. Why? Why is that so important? Isn't the digital copy good enough? No, it's really not. Uh, I love the digital copy for research, but there is so much power in the written word of God. We're going to talk about that a little bit uh, today. But the written word of God is so powerful and cannot change. Digital copies can change. Even that's why I have my uh, New American Standard from 1977, because the newer editions they've made some changes to it that I'm not a big fan of. And so the older copy, the more original copies, are more true to what I feel like the Hebrew and the Greek are actually saying. They didn't upgrade it. Instead, they they tooled the newer versions and a lot of versions to be more culturally acceptable and strayed from the power of the word. So we're not going to talk about that uh, today. We're going to talk about it a little bit tomorrow. and It's going to be really, really fun. But so even though I'm going to show you this screen uh, with John 1, 1 on it, I want you to follow along in your own Bible. Now, this is out of like I said, I'm doing my NASB, and so I have pulled up the NASB right now. But we're going to jump back and forth between a few different versions. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, is verse 2. I think that right there is so incredible that even before the Word was written, the Word was with God and was God from the beginning. So there was an existence of your Bible before the Bible was even written. This is crazy to think about. 
But it really, it, it is. And so let's go. I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a sneak peek, actually, a little bit of why I love um, digital for research because this is my um, blue letter Bible and I'm gonna click oh nope I hit the wrong button let me hit back I gotta make it a little bigger is what I'm gonna do I have it tiny so that it fits on the screen hang on is that no you guys can still see it it's good we're good okay so I'm gonna hit the strongs button and now I can see all of the Strong's numbers. What does that mean? And if you have a Strong's concordance, which I'll have in here for tomorrow because I thought I had it in here, you can look up what each one of these words are. It's really, really fun. And so I can click on, because it's digital, I can click on this G3056, and that means it's Greek number 3056, and the word there is logos. Logos is the spoken word of, uh, a lot of times it's of God. Uh, it actually just, just the spoken word, and you can see times when it was used uh, if you scroll through and see these other options. And it works exact same way in your Strong's Concordance. It's really, really fun. So, in the beginning was the word, the spoken word of God. And, and we see that, we see that the spoken word of God in Genesis, right? In the beginning, and then God said, what? Let there be light. Doosh, light was. In the beginning was the spoken word of God. And that spoken word of God wasn't just a action, it was a person. It's really, really trippy when we think about it. But that's exactly how it was. And we're going to talk about that here as we keep going. So, hang on, i got to shrink it back up so it fits on the screen. There we go. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. There was nothing that was ever created that wasn't through him. And then verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. I think that's so cool. We're, I'm going to jump down because it's going to talk about John here for a second, but it's going to come back to that thought of light. In verse 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Now that word enlighten every man, it's actually talking about, it says, or which enlightens every person coming into the world. There's a light produced by the word of God that enlightens every man. What is that talking about? It's the light bulb, the light bulb moment. When you're reading, have you ever had that? You're reading the word and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I totally get it. This verse is so cool. It connects with this other verse that God had me meditating on. I didn't realize what that meant. And then all of a sudden, what is that? That's the light of men enlightening, bringing life. It's the life of and the light are connected to the word of God, the spoken word of God that is a person. Then let's come, jump down to John 1, 12. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those to who, who believe in his name. Now verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh my gosh, I just realized I wasn't showing you. That's okay. You're reading along. John 1.14 then just solidifies that the spoken word of God that we see in Genesis is Jesus. That... And if you look at the Hebrew word for word, that's used for the word of God, um, it actually carries 
the same uh, feeling as in how a thought is only made manifest through speaking, that God the Father is only made manifest through the Word of God, through Jesus. And that's why Jesus himself said that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because he is the Word. It's really crazy how this works out. And so, hang on, I don't want to show you that yet. So when we're diving into the Word, we have to realize this is more than just a book. You remember we left off with Hebrews 4.12 yesterday. For the Word of God is living and active. How can it be living and active? Because it is Jesus. Does it look like Jesus? Does it feel like Jesus? Not in the natural, but remember, everything God does is supernatural. So if we limit who God is to what we can see with our eyes, we're missing the whole point. He is spirit, and those that worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. We have to let go of what we can see with these eyes and comprehend what makes sense to our own heads and begin to take on the realities of the world or of the word so that it can transform how we approach everything. And it comes down to how are we going to do this? How are we going to read the word? You know what? I've got one more proof to you that Jesus is the word because a lot of people know John 1 as the answer. But let's look at Revelation chapter 19. So grab your Bibles, open up to Revelation chapter 19. We're going to go to verse 13. And then do one of you want to read that one for me out of your uh, Bible and then tell me what version you have? Revelation, you know what? Why don't I do this? I'll put it up like this so you can see it highlighted. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. Tammy, you want to read it? I have the New Living Translation. Okay. Um, so it's 1913? Correct. Okay. Um, he wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. So right there is another um, opening in the word, another verse that says that there is a being who is the word of God. Now, one of the rules of, wait, Tim, you got to mute yourself again. One of the rules of Bible study is to not just take a single verse, but also begin to look at the context. What do the verses around that say? And so I'm going to put this back up here. And we're going to look at, that was verse 13. We're going to do 11 through, let's do uh, through 16. So I'm going to read it quick. You read along with me. And you tell me if this doesn't define for sure who this person is with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it, called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes a flame of fire, and on his head many diadems. Pause for a sec. In case you've ever heard the word diadems, and you're like, what in the world is that? It's a fancy crown. It's a jeweled crown. And so that's what it is. All right, back to uh, on his head many diadems, and he has a name written which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white, clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that it may, he may strike down the nations, And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And his robe, or and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written: King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who's that talking about? 
There's no question to me. Elise, who do you think that's talking about? God. Yes, that is God. Specifically, it's God the Son, Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords. And we can tell by other verses that Jesus was given that authority and that name because of, or I should say, given that name when he died and rose from the dead. Those things were condoned on him. It was, it's so cool. And so this is Jesus. That when we look at our word, it is Jesus. How crazy is that? So Jesus is the word. The word of God is Jesus. The, the, when you look in Greek and it says logos, anytime you see that, which you can see, we'll show you on the concordance and things uh, tomorrow. That's super fun. Pastor Kate cannot wait. By the way, I, I was gonna. I told her I'd find a way to work you in. So here we go. Pastor Kate is joining me. Hello, Pastor Kate. Ma. Let's see if I can pull this off. Hello. So anyway, yeah. So <laughs> she's got. She she's like, you gotta make sure you say this line and do this. And so I was like, you know what? Let's just pull a picture of her when she's when I'm quoting Kate. I'll put a picture up, and that will just be kind of fun. All right. So logos, the spoken word of God, is Jesus. So anytime you see. Old Testament or New Testament, that they were speaking the word of God. They weren't just releasing the power of God. They were releasing Jesus himself with the Holy Spirit's power, backing it up to perform the things that Jesus was released to do. Think about New Testament. Jesus said, just like in Genesis chapter 1, God came up with a plan he spoke and released Jesus. Then you see in New Testament, what happens? Jesus says, I don't do anything that I don't see my father doing. God the Father builds the plan and Jesus sets out to do it. The word of God and he accomplishes it through the power of the spirit, just like Genesis. I think that is that to me, that's just, it's crazy. It's, it's cool. It, no one talks like this, but this is really what is going on. So it's not just a book. We, because it is Jesus, we can't approach our Bibles like, okay, Chris going to read my Bible. You know, there's, this is life. This is light. This is Jesus, Jesus himself. Amen. I love what, what Paul said to the Thessalonian church. Uh, they lived in the city called Thess. So their book is to the Thessalonians, kind of like people from Florida are called Floridians. That's kind of how it works. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul writes this, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word, and the word there is logos, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Every time we're reading our Bibles, we are with Jesus and we are releasing God's power for us who believe. Every time we read our Bibles, we don't have to wonder, or how do we get in God's presence? You are in God's presence right now holding that word. Whether you feel the tingles or not when you open this up, whether you have the little, ooh, Jesus is here, it feels so good, or you don't, the reality is, the truth is, he is right here with us. There's no, no other option. There's no other plan. When we open that Bible and we begin to read and see what God is saying, we are sitting in the presence of the Almighty God instantly. We are with the Godhead because what is Ephesians 2, 6 says that Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. You're hanging out technically, with the Trinity when you open this bad boy up. 
Because if Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, when you open this up and you're with Jesus, that means you have to be also at the right hand of the Father. And then who's who's hovering over the waters to perform it? The Holy Spirit. To make the words that you're reading a reality. And we're going to talk about uh, him uh, more tomorrow. It's going to, oh my word, tomorrow is going to be packed. It's going to be so full. All right. So I said I was going to pull Kate up when, when I was going to do a quote from Kate. So there we go. Picture Kate sitting here with me. This is a Kate-ism. She says, when I know or come to the knowledge that his word holds the same authority and even more today as when Jesus spoke those words, then it will be alive on my lips, in my life, and through me. That's the kind of transformation that God expects us to receive when we're in our word. So who are we to go to our word not expecting that same level of transformation to be released within us, for that same level of authority to be released in everything that we put our hand to that aligns with his word? Because if we allow the word to dictate what we're doing, what we're saying, how we think, how we act, then it has all the authority of Jesus and the Holy Spirit backing you up. No wonder it says, we'll talk about this uh, tomorrow and and uh, Thursday. No wonder it says that when the person that meditates on, on the word day and night, that everything they do prospers. Because when you hang out with the word, you are unlocking so much ridiculous power because you're not just hanging out with a book. You're hanging out with the God, him, Godhead himself. So how powerful are God's words when spoken? Well, let's take a look at it. We can see when Jesus was born, before, actually before he was born, it was actually the spoken word. Word of God produced a divine combination of supernatural and natural seed in Mary's womb without even having a seed from natural man. In my head, I would think I can see God's transformative power. He's going to transform, you know, what I apply to. But this was so much more. This was his creative power. It didn't simply transform a natural seed. But the word was the seed that produced impossibilities naturally. And then what happened? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what how powerful the spoken word of God is. I got another one. This one really blew my mind because I knew about the virgin birth and that kind of explains it a little bit. But what about... This one really is a mind bender for me. John chapter 15, verse 3. Just go ahead and look it up. I'm going to pull it up on my page here next to me. John, what did I say? John 15, 13. No, 15, 3. John 15, 3. Pull it up next to me. So this is Jesus talking. It's some of his final words to his disciples and and prayer. So this is right after the verses where we know John 15, 1 and 2. I'm the vine and my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And then we skip right over verse 3 and we go to verse 4. But look at what verse 3 says. You are already clean Because of the word which I have spoken to you. Just think about that for a second. Had he died for their sins yet? No. Could they they have his righteousness at that moment? I would have said no. But because of his spoken word, he had already made them clean even before he had died 
on the cross for their sins. By just releasing God's word, God's will through his voice, they had already been made clean in God's eyes. That's crazy to me. That blows my mind a little bit. Because, I mean, you think about that. They, they'd followed him. They'd served him. But it wasn't because of their own actions. It was because Jesus spoke and they were made clean. They were purified in God's eyes by Jesus simply speaking it over them. How cool is that? That messes with my theology even a little bit because they were still Old Testament realities. The new covenant hadn't been ratified in his blood yet, and yet they were pure and clean in God's eyes simply because Jesus spoke it. That, I I don't know, maybe that doesn't mess with you like it does me. That just blows my mind a little bit that simply with the words coming out of his mouth, that they were made clean before the price had been paid for their sins. So just as Jesus' words carried that unlimited, crazy, supernatural power and natural things responded, we can do the exact same things today by his word spoken through us. When we release God's words... When we release them into ourselves by reading, when we release them into the world by speaking, it carries that same power that was able to plant seed in Mary's body. That same power that did what would seem impossible to me, that the disciples could be pure and clean before God, even before he died on the cross. That same power now dwells in us. It's, it's really the fulfillment of what we see in, in Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Uh, you probably have heard me say this because it's uh, one of my favorites. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. This is God speaking right here. God saying that as he releases these words out of his mouth, there's the promise, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish, and let me go again, shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. But we are made new in him, we are one with Christ. And so if you begin saying what God is saying, if you begin holding to what these scriptures say with an unwavering faith, then that verse is also true about what you release out of your mouth. When you say what God's word says, it's just as powerful as if God himself was saying it because guess what? God himself is saying it. He is the Word. And that's why we can, we can know that when we say what the Word is saying, when we have a confidence that we know His will, and whether it's, it's a promise in His Word or something that He's revealed to our heart, that when we say what God is saying, that what like 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says, This is the confidence with which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the request which we asked of him. Why? Because Isaiah, so shall my word that goes out of my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. Who purposes? He purposes. And she'll succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Who sent it? He sent it. But when we align our words with his word, then it carries the same power as if God himself spoke those words into your existence, 
into your family's existence, into your city's existence, your school's existence, your your church's existence, into every natural sphere of influence that you release this word into, it carries that same power. And he will perform it. That's what Jeremiah, I'm going to hit a few verses real fast. Jeremiah 1.12. Jeremiah 1.12 says, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. I'll say it one more time. Joshua 21, 45. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Let's go, let's go to a book we all love, Lamentations. It's our favorite book. In the, well, maybe not our favorite book in the Bible, but it's in there. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 17. The first half of it says, The Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed a long time ago. Ezekiel 12, 28. Therefore, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. None of my words will be delayed any longer. Whatever I say will be fulfilled, declares the sovereign Lord. That's a whole lot of verses right there. Letting you know. His word will not return void. His word will and cannot return fail. What this word says is more true than anything you can see in the world around you. And if the world around you or your thoughts challenge what this word says, then your thoughts or the world are wrong every time. Because this is the truth. Jesus, Jesus says, what does he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Jesus himself said that. And then, uh, hang on, let me go. I'm skipping ahead of here a little bit. Jesus says that. Then the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. That's what Jesus himself said. So those two are teaming up together to release the truth. Truth cannot change, it is the truth. People can contradict it or try to. People can say it doesn't apply to them. But the truth is true. So how did Jesus use this word of God? What did he do? Wait, wait. I got another Pastor Kateism. Hang on. Coming up. Wait a second. There it is. This is what she said. Jesus walked out the word in faith. He spoke the word with authority, and he did not allow natural reason or the mind of the flesh to alter his reliance on it ever. That's so good. I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus walked out the word in faith. He spoke the word with authority, and he did not allow natural reason or the mind of the flesh to alter his reliance on it. And we can see that in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Romans 8, 6 says, For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Anytime we let man's wisdom or our own ability to reason something out, trump what God's word says, we've fallen into idolatry. That's really what it is. It's either self-worship or the fear of man, other worship. We're, because we are believing, putting our full reliance on something opposite of him. And yes, it is him. When it's something that the word says, you're like, man, I just don't feel like this is true for me right now. Don't say things like that. You know what that means? You don't know him. You don't know the word. And so people would say, but you got to use wisdom. I know the word says this, but God's wisdom is foolishness to man. 
I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 says. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. How fun is that? It's foolishness. Uh, do you know, there's a couple of verses, even Psalms chapter 2, verse 4, and Psalms 37. Hang on. Psalms 37, uh, it's like 12 and 13, that show that God actually laughs at the wisdom of the wicked. Like, they, they think they're wise, and so they build these plans. And the Bible says God actually laughs at them. I think that, that makes me smile. He's like, okay, you're so wise. You're so brilliant. Yeah, I'm going to see what happens next. And he foils their plans every time. It's, and so if we think about that, we laugh at the, okay, yeah, God's against the wicked, but what is the wicked? What are the wicked? Those who don't do his will. That's really what it comes down to. What's his will? It's found right here. His will is his word. He'll never contradict the word of God with his will. And so his word is his will. We know that always. And we can let that guide our life. And don't let man's wisdom, man's thinking, even your own ability. I don't want to move forward into this until I can figure this out a little bit more. I've had that thought. But what am I saying? I don't really want to move forward in this until I'm more God than God is in this area. That's really what it comes down to. All right, random question. Random question. I feel like I've monologued for a while here. Random question. What is the last word in the Bible? Does anybody know what the very last word is in the Bible? If you don't know, look it up. It's kind of fun. And you're going to read it and you're like, oh, come on. That's ridiculous. So go grab your Bible. It's the very last chapter is Revelation chapter 22. Let me see what verse it is. Verse 21. Revelation 22, 21. What's the last word? Elise, unmute yourself. Tell me what it is. Amen. Amen. It's like done. Amen. Like it's ending of a prayer. All right. Second random question. Who knows what amen means? Is it something we just say at the end of our prayer because God likes it, or does it have a purpose? What does amen or amen mean? Michael got it in the chat. Tammy, do you know it? Go ahead and unmute um, yourself. So be it? Yes, that's right. So be it. Let it be so. That's what amen means. It's like uh, putting an exclamation mark on the end of your sentence. Do you know, uh, kind of getting off on side tangents here, the Hebrews didn't use punctuation. And so the way they would put an exclamation mark on something is they would either use a word like amen or they would repeat it. So when it says like in uh, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, that's there putting an exclamation mark on the word rejoice. But they couldn't, they don't have a way to do it because they had no punctuation. So how did they do it? By repeating themselves. So in case you're, when you're reading the Bible and you see you're like, why do they keep repeating themselves? There's two options. One, if it's almost an exact copy, it's... Um, it's they're adding the exclamation mark, and then uh, I'm gonna throw this in. I'm just gonna throw it in because it helps I, you understand. Uh, poetry for Hebrews for Israelites is different than how we do poetry. So when we're doing poetry, Elise, how would you do it? You start r looking for rhyming words, right? You, that's what we do. Roses are red, violets are blue, and then quickly you're like, okay, what rhymes with blue? I need something that rhymes with blue. 
I like your shoes even with that goo. I, I, or I don't know. It's like I'm horrible at rhyming. We rhyme words. Uh, the Hebrews rhyme thoughts. And so when you're going through Psalms and you see that it says something and then it says almost the same thing just in a different way, that's them doing poetry. That's them rhyming. They didn't rhyme words. They rhymed thoughts. And so when they say something, you can see it in uh, when, oh, I'm not going to be able to find this quickly, but uh, when uh, the Israelites go through the Red Sea and they get to the other side and Deborah, or not Deborah, uh, Moses' sister was, oh my word, I can't remember right now. That's horrible. Here, when, anyway, when they go through, Aaron to be most people, I just got to read it. Hang on. It's in Exodus, hang on, 14, nope. The songs, the songs in our Exodus chapter 15 and, well, yeah, Miriam. That's the word I was, the name I was looking for. Moses' name is Miriam. Yep. Okay. If you look as they go through, they rhyme like uh, Exodus 15, 11. Who is like thee among the gods, O Lord? Who is like thee majestic in holiness? It's rhyming that thought. Uh, verse 8, at the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. It's saying the same thing, just in a different way. That's them rhyming. And so that's what they're even putting into song, which Psalms, by the way, is the Hebrew songbook. We have hymnals in some of our churches, or maybe your grandma's church has hymnals. They have a song book of this is the different songs we sing. Uh, Psalms is the song book for the Hebrews. And so when they'd go to synagogue, they would begin to sing Psalms. So when you see um, Jesus on the cross and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's actually the first line of a song that they all knew that we know as Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then, you know what most of the Hebrews probably did then after that? Sang the rest of the song. And if you look at Psalms 22, it is an exact detail of what Jesus was going through at that very minute. He was proving himself to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament, even in his last words. How cool is that? But you guys got me off track here. My random question threw me off, and now we have only 11 minutes left, and I totally sidetracked. But hopefully that helps. So when you go to your word, rhyming thoughts is poetry, or a repeated sentence is an exclamation mark. Tammy, you look like you got something you want to jump in and say. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Okay. So... That took me off on a little tangent that I didn't plan on going through, but it's true, and that will help you. So whenever, let's get back to where we are talking about. Whenever there's a battle within us to not act on the Word of God, it reveals we don't know Him like we should in that area. Because we don't want to step into that. The only reason we wouldn't want to step into that is because we don't see Christ in us big enough to accomplish that thing which he's leading us into. It's an inability to know, it's, or sorry, it's a, or my pastor would say it's unbelief. You don't believe God in this area is big enough to carry you through and accomplish what his word says he will do. And so then you hold back or you question or you, you uh, let's test this out a little bit. Let's see. I'm going to wait on this and we'll really see if this is something that God's going to come through. And what are, we, what are we doing? We're trying to have faith and wait for something to be seen before we believe. That's not faith. That's not how, how our life works in Christianity. We believe and then we see. How do we get there? 
You, how do we get that faith to just believe and then we'll see? What we talked about yesterday. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to dive into our word and discover who he is because who he is does not change. And what, we, what really trips us up, we don't expect him to change unless we're thinking about who he is in us. I know God out there is big. God in this traveling minister is big. God in heaven is big. He's all powerful. No doubts. God in me. Mm, can he really do this? Will he really? I just don't. What does that mean? We don't know who he is. We have a mental awareness of what the word says, but we haven't made it a reality on the inside of us. What is it? Hang on, I'm going to skip forward. Oh, I didn't write it down. The The Hebrew word for no. Oh, we talked about it yesterday. The, remember, the Hebrew word for no doesn't mean a mental awareness of something. It means you've tested it out. You've experienced and proven that this thing is true. That's what God wants us to know his word. Not just memorize it so we can fill our brains with something and move on to the next thing, but that we can know the word by experience. Am I saying not to memorize the word? No, that's not what I'm saying. But if we limit it just to our mental ability to have an awareness of the scriptures, but and we never meditate it on it so that it begins to transform us, then we're missing the point of what God wants to do within us. He doesn't change Because he's in us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what does the word say? Ephesians. Let's look this one up. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 is where we're going to start. I'm going to pull this up next to me even. Ephesians 1. And I'm going to read this time. I think I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version. Really like New King James Version. They haven't changed since the early 80s. It's still that same way. And... uh, I really like that. They haven't let a lot of this other um, goofiness that some of the other translations have got into. So Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 19. Let me pull that up next to me. There we go. All right. Ephesians. Man, that's tough to start there even. This is Paul praying for the Ephesians church. And let's see, verse verse 17, he starts asking that they would have an awareness of who he is, that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened, that they would know these different aspects. And he lists three things. One, the hope of his calling. Two, what are the riches of his glory in the inheritance and the saints? And then verse 19, and what the exceedingly, exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated at his right hand in the heavenlies far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one in which is to come. And he put all under his feet and gave him head over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You are his body, which means you are the fullness of him who fills all in all. And and Paul prayed, Lord, let them be aware. Let them understand, let them experience and know by your knowing, by out of experience, the exceedingly greatness of his power, that same power that raised Christ from the dead. How awesome is that? That is a lot of power available to us. And it goes even farther. Let's go two more books. Let's go uh, to... The end of Ephesians chapter 3. 
Ephesians chapter 3. Let's start in... Oh, what do I want to start in? Let's do... Let's just do verse 20 and 21. Somebody want to read verse Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 for me? Elise, go for it. God is able to do far more than we could ever ask for or imagine. He does everything by his power that is working in us. Give him glory in the church and in Jesus Christ. Give him glory through all time and forever and ever. Amen. Oh, there is amen. It's sneaking back in again. Amen. Now, I love that because my version is a little bit different. It says, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And here's the kicker. According to the power that works where? In us. What is that power that works in us? It's his word. It's his spirit. It's God himself working in us and through us to perform everything that he wants done. That's why it says, uh, like, um, what is it? Proverbs chapter 3, verse, oh, shoot, what is it? Proverbs 3, 4 and 5. The trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Verse, or actually that's five and six. Proverbs three, five and six. Uh, verse six in the New Living Translation says, In everything you do, put God first and he will direct you and crown your efforts with his success. I love that because what happens? You put him first. He's the initiator. He'll direct you. Then he'll empower what you do and he'll bring it to great success by his power. What? His plans. We don't have hardly anything to do with this anymore. It says in everything you do, put God first. What does that mean? It doesn't mean we're going to pick what actions we like and then say God bless these plans. No, it's going to him, going to his word, putting him first. And he'll direct us through the word, through his spirit, to know his will. And then he empowers his will. Just like Genesis chapter 1. God inspired the thought, releases Jesus, the word, and the Holy Spirit performs it. In the Gospels, God inspires the thought, Jesus steps out to multiply the the bread and the fishes, to do whatever God wanted to do, because he said he did nothing without seeing God the Father do it. And then what happens? The Holy Spirit empowers the impossible that God had planned. It's the same exact way with us. That's why. We have to be in our words. So what do we do? I'm gonna, I want to give you really fast because I just saw what time it is. Really fast. What do we do with this then? Don't just read it. This is hanging out with God himself. So don't just read it. Seek him. What is Matthew 7, 7? Seek him and you'll find it, right? Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. What's the first part? Ask and you'll find. Well, I've heard, now I'm slaughtering it. Just look it up. Matthew chapter 7. If we seek him, we will find him. If we're not seeking him when we go to our word, we're missing the whole point. When, when the word of God died on the cross... It ratified the new covenant through his blood. Now, all that is provided in the new covenant, which is illustrated right here, is ours the minute we surrender our life to him, making him the Lord of our life. So we got to know what is in here. What does it say about me? Who did God create me to be? How does he want me to live? And that is all revealed by his spirit through the word. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says that everything we need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by His divine power. We have to renew our minds to those truths by saturating our minds with the Word of God, saturating our minds with Jesus and that continual washing of the water of the Word over our brains, over the way we think, begins to transform us, just like it talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And when we go to our Word, we're not just going to read it. We're going to study to prove it within ourselves. Not just read it and say, oh, that was nice, but prove it. We're going to expect to experience what the Word says in our everyday lives, therefore proving it. Like it says, um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. That word approved there means a, going through a time of testing and coming out with a winning grade. That's really what it looks like. Putting it to the test and discovering, yes, this is true. So, 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. You can accurately handle the word of truth. Some people right there begin to doubt, but don't doubt that you can understand it. What? A Jesus, let's go back to Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I don't see him struggling to find the answers he needed for God to know his will or to defeat the devil with the word. And then what is one, one uh, First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Here's the point that I want to get to. But we have the mind of Christ. If Christ is is the truth, and Christ is the word. And if we have the mind of Christ, then the truth is we always can understand the word of God. Anything that would contradict that would be coming against the knowledge of God in you. So what uh, was that? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, that a weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but for this, or uh, we're just going to have to look it up. Second Corinthians, let me look it up because I didn't write this one down. Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. I have too many verses partially memorized. And what's throwing me off is that I keep switching versions. All right, Second Corinthians 10, 4 says... For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but in mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Notice it's not saying against who you could be or against the situation. All of these things that would come against you fulfilling God's plan for your life are actually against the knowledge of God in you, who he can be in you, who he wants to be through you, that exceedingly, abundantly great power beyond what we can ask or think according to the power at work in you. It's, It's thoughts coming against you or coming against him in you, trying to convince you that you cannot do what he says to do. You cannot flow with him the way he says you can. You will not understand the word when the truth is we can always understand it. We just have to rely on him to teach us. Learn how to read it with the Holy Spirit, which is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. All right, I'm cutting myself off there. What questions do you guys have? I kind of really blasted you with probably 45 scriptures there, it feels like. It was just scripture, scripture, scripture. But there's no better way to prove Jesus is the word and how we should approach Jesus in the word than looking at the word. So that's why I I never feel like you can get too many scriptures, even though that was a ton of them. So I want to make sure you all have it and you don't have any questions. 
Tammy says none. Lise, any questions? No? Michael, you can type something in the chat or pop on your, your speaker, whichever. Elise, I'm bummed you will, won't be here tomorrow, but we'll upload the recording pretty quick. Michael says no, sir. All right. Well, I will say hi to Pastor Kate for you, Elise. She will be back here tomorrow, so you'll catch the recording. Everybody else, uh, join us live. Tomorrow, we're resuming at the original time. So it, today, we jumped in an hour early. Tomorrow, we're going back to the, the original time. Hey! So that would be um, 7 p.m. Eastern time will be tomorrow and Thursday. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, everybody. And go dive into your word and expect to see Jesus in it. He will reveal who he wants to be in and through you in your word. All right. Bye, everybody.